Welcome to the Twisted Mirror. I am so excited for today's episode. You can think of it as a holiday gift, a submitted story from a listener, F. John Nihote, called Queen of Pain, a dark, whimsical tale sure to put you on your best behavior. I highly suggest earphones and a quiet room for this one so you can get the full experience. Before we dive into that, a special thank you to patrons of the show who help keep this production going. Twisted Mirror is completely independent. I write, voice act, and edit all the episodes, with the exception of the occasional submission or a guest actor. Patrons get early ad-free episodes, bonus content, discounts to merch, and more, with tiers starting as low as $3 a month. You can also do one-time donations if subscriptions aren't your thing, all at twistedmirrorpodcast.com. There are other very appreciated ways you can help too. You can rate and review the show or tell your friends who love the macabre about Twisted Mirror or post about it on Facebook, Reddit, TikTok, or wherever people are looking for fresh podcasts to listen to. If you want to stay in the loop between episodes, you can find Twisted Mirror on Facebook where there is a page and a group, IG, or TikTok. You can simply search for Twisted Mirror within the app. Merch, the story submission form, and everything I previously discussed is also at twistedmirrorpodcast.com. Relevant links and content warnings are also in the show notes. All right, time to leave this world behind and step toward the Twisted Mirror, where another world awaits us. In some ways, it is stranger and scarier than our own. But perhaps in other ways, it is more just. I'll let you be the judge. You are now staring into the twisted mirror. The holidays are full of cheer and all that. Sure. And that jolly, rosy cheeks fella has been designated the official mascot for Christmas. We get it. If you're good all year, you'll drop off your presents, eat your cookies, yada yada. But what happens to the naughty folks? Coal in your stocking seems a bit mild, if you're asking me. Well, there are old tales that answer this question. Much older legends than the well-fed, perky Coca-Cola-born Santa we see today. Tales that remind us that if we are not nice, we may encounter that same treatment ourselves. Perhaps one thousandfold. And sure, they are just legends. But in the world of the Twisted Mirror, legends often bleed into reality. Roger stood in the baggage claim area of the airport terminal, his bag slung over one shoulder, shifting to find comfort in the heated space in his bulky coat. Lawrence stood beside him, playing with the extended handle of his luggage, visibly impatient. Did he have to fly coach? Lawrence sneered. He did what he could, man. You know, it's been a hell of a few years for him. It was true. Like so many other businesses, Billy's had been floundering since the COVID shutdowns. On top of that, Billy's wife had left and taken the kids to her mother's under the guise of protecting the kids from exposure. When she'd found out Billy had succeeded in getting his business deemed essential, keeping him at work, she never moved back and finally filed for divorce almost a year ago just after the new year. he just spent his first Christmas officially away from his family. It's only been a few minutes. Look, here comes the crowd. Roger gestured to a new wave of people flooding the escalators, headed down to where they were. Roger remembered how he had to plead with Billy over the last few months just to come. They'd been planning the trip for ten years, ever since they'd all visited together on winter break from business school. 
None of them had had the money to go home for the holidays, nor enough to really party properly, as Lawrence had stated. So they'd bummed around in this small German town they'd been told had one decent nightclub and a lot of local festivities. It had been Lawrence's idea to return ten years later to do it right. I told you'd be nothing but dead weight, Lawrence snorted, satisfied with himself. Roger rolled his eyes. Have you ever had to wait for anything? Roger wondered aloud. Nope. Lawrence was curt and matter-of-fact. Of course not. Lawrence came from royalty. Not literal royalty, but current business royalty. Old money. Business school had been a check in the box for him. Unlike Roger and Billy, who had had to build their own businesses from the ground up. Billy raised an industrial construction business. Roger a sporting goods store. Lawrence had never wanted for anything, and boy, did it show sometimes. Roger caught sight of Billy breaking through the crowd, unmistakable as ever with his long, blonde hair tucked under a baseball cap, an even longer blonde beard caught in his shoulder strap. When he looked up and saw them, he grinned a small grin on one side, showing no teeth. Depression hung on him like chains on Jacob Marley, but he still lit up his whole face, save his normally bright blue eyes. Hey guys, a valiant attempt at being cheerful, but so transparent. Billy always had been a terrible liar. How was your flight back there in coach, William? Lawrence asked, knowing Billy hated when people called him by his legal name. It was great. Billy tried to cheerfully lie again, never wanting to be a drag. Then he added, I think I caught a whiff of your caviar. Billy grinned at Lawrence, a little more convincing this time. Hmm. Lawrence's cold dismissal made Billy scowl. Lawrence looked out towards the exit, not even feigning interest. Great to see you, Rod. It's been too long. You said it. You got any bags coming? Nah, just my carry-on. You know me, I travel light. Billy wasn't lying. He'd always been a self-described minimalist, though Roger had always thought he just didn't own much. Of course, now everything he had managed to accumulate was either tied up in his construction business or the divorce. Which say we get out of here, Billy suggested. Yeah, let's roll! Roger tried to rally his compatriots, and they all turned towards the exit. Lawrence had rented a town car and driver for the entirety of their stay. Gustave was an old man with a quiet demeanor and a shy smile as he held the door. Lawrence never put his phone down as he entered past, but he smiled bigger when Roger and Billy thanked him. Lawrence dominated the conversation on the way to the hotel, the restaurant, and yet again on the way to the club. Much to his annoyance, Billy acknowledged and engaged with all his stories about his successes and vacations, houses, cars, lovers, etc. Roger could tell Billy didn't want to take part in Lawrence's self-fluffing, but he was too polite to let someone go unacknowledged. Roger sat up front with the driver. They exchanged a few pleasantries with Roger's limited knowledge of German, coupled with the driver's broken English, but Roger thought he got the gist. The main drags were packed with people milling around. Pubs and storefronts were stacked. Even the alleys were loaded with people. Roger asked Gustav if it was always this lively right after Christmas. Gustav explained that many families stayed from Christmas to the Epiphany, a Catholic rite celebrating the revelation of Jesus being the Son of God, taking place on the twelfth day after Christmas, January 6th, by our current calendar. Roger never realized that's where the 12 days of Christmas came from. Roger told him the last time they were together, they'd gotten to experience Krampusnacht. Lawrence stopped chewing Billy's ear off and immediately interrupted. What's this about a Krampusnacht? Roger rolled his eyes. Lawrence had way too much fun joining the Krampusloff. 
Apparently, it was a yearly custom to wear scary masks and bells and chase kids around, shaking chains and waving sticks at them. Houses and businesses alike were handing out beers and or shots to the runners. It had been a hell of a time. Lawrence, however, had gotten too drunk and sent a few children off whimpering after being whipped in the legs with a tree branch. Uh, just regaling our driver with some tales of my own, Roger tossed back matter-of-factly. Any parts with me in them? Roger laughed and let Lawrence stew on it. He'd forgotten how obnoxious Lawrence had been when the schnapps started flowing. If the botchery is on your mind, I would put it away, my friend. The first day of Christmas is past. It is the Frau's time now, Gustav offered, his tone slightly ominous. Danke, Gustav, but we're all single. Roger answered without thinking as a pang of regret jabbed him for inadvertently being insensitive about Billy's divorce. He tried to recover. No frows at home pulling our chains. He'd meant to sound confident and funny, but it sounded more hesitant and sheepish. Nine, nine, nine. Not the wives. The flau. He dropped his voice low. Flau Berta. Billy leaned forward, his brow furrowed, attentive. Lawrence shoved a flask in Roger's face as he leaned over the center console. Great, is she hot? His breath filled the cab with the scent of peppermint and alcohol. Nine, 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 Gustav began. The flau is... Complisiert. He stopped searching for the right word as Roger struggled to remember his German. Complicated? Billy asked. Yeah, Gustav interjected. Complicated. Very good, Wilhelm. Billy grinned. Gustav had heard Lawrence calling him William all night, so he didn't know any better. But the old man's tone was so endearing. Complicated. Count me out. Lawrence's tone was boorish as ever as he settled heavily back into his seat. How is she complicated? Roger sought to write the conversation before it could be derailed. The old German was quiet for a moment as he collected his thoughts. The flower is different things to different people. Some say she is a Christmas spirit and a fierce lover of children. These people see her in the few hours after dark as a stooped old woman in all in rags. She cares for small children who would have died unbaptized and punishes young mothers who have been lazy in keeping their homes clean. And when clothes were made at home, fabric spinning was down. But some say she is a pagan goddess from the north, sometimes called Holly. These people have seen on the wee morning hours, outside pubs and fun places. She is almost always seen at the Feast of the Epiphany, as a great and tall woman, powerful and beautiful. She stays seated so as not to reveal her otherworldly form. Or maybe she's waiting to be asked to dance. I think the crone is just in her work uniform. Gustav giggled a bit. Business before pleasure. Billy laughed at the last bit, along with the old man. Lawrence was silent, wearing a face somewhere between confusion and distaste. Roger found some words. Boy, when you say complisiert, you mean complisiert. That got a chuckle from all. One second. Billy startled Roger by leading the conversation for once. If she's a pagan goddess, why would she be at a party celebrating Jesus? It is said the Frau loves festivities. Anything to break up the cold months of long hard work and darkness. But how can people reconcile believing in both Jesus and a pagan god, he pressed. Where there is light, there is also darkness, Gustav began. And there are shades in between. Jesus may be our light, our Lord and Savior, but there are other old things in the world. And who are we to say who they decide to be? 
The old man's words stuck with Roger the rest of the drive. He was actually surprised when the car stopped outside the club. Happy festivities, gentlemen. I will be close when you need me, he said, pulling a smartphone from his pocket and waving it with a big grin, proud of owning the device. Thanks, Goose, Roger said cheerily as Gustav waved and looked out to make his way back into traffic. Boy, what about this line, Billy said surveying the tendril of shivering partiers winding from the door and down the street. What line, Lawrence said, thumbing furiously at his phone, not even bothering to look up. I knew you guys would take your sweet princessy time getting out of the hotel. Was the complimentary porridge really worth it? He was referring to the bowls the hotel staff had been handing out in the lobby. Oddly enough, it seemed patrons weren't even eating it there. The dining section was closed. Roger had seen what seemed like everyone collecting bowls and heading right back to their rooms. No, but it's rude to refuse hospitality. They were offering it personally. Already scooped, Roger said. Come on, I made arrangements. Lawrence led them down the street away from the entrance and cut through the line down the alley. If the sidewalk was crowded... The alley was mobbed. Drunken party animals stepping outside for a smoke were packed in small groups, laughing and joking. Lawrence surged forward while Roger struggled to keep up with Billy, riding his shirt tails, apologizing profusely as they bumbled past the smokers. Oh, come on! They heard Lawrence shout up ahead. Roger rolled his eyes and bumbled faster. They were foreigners in a strange city here, and Roger knew he'd better catch up quickly before Lawrence's spoiled mouth got them all into trouble. Too late. By the time Roger caught up with him, almost barreling right into him, Lawrence was in full tirade. What kind of stupid old whore do you have to be to be dragging kids through an alley at this time of night? Lawrence was raving, waving his phone in frustration. With smokers packed in on either side, Roger couldn't see around him, and he was taller than Roger, about six foot two, and Roger struggled to see over his shoulder. In front of him stooped a tiny figure, draped in rags. She may have been five feet tall or so, if she stood upright. As it was, she was hunched nearly 90 degrees at the waist. Roger could see tangled gray hair flooding out from under an old, woven cap. But he couldn't peer over Lawrence's shoulder enough to see her face. Behind her, however, was indeed a gaggle of young kids, aging maybe five years and younger. Too many to have possibly been all siblings. The other people in her wake were pressed up against the alley walls to give them room not laughing or joking like the rest. They wore somber, perhaps even fearful, expressions, eyeing the children cautiously. The old lady growled something in German, too low for Roger to hear. I don't fucking understand you, lady, and and I don't care. Get the fuck... Lawrence started, but Roger yanked him aside. Dude, you're not helping anything. Just let her by, Roger interrupted. Without waiting for a response, he focused on the old woman waving her forward. Come on, Grandma. She regarded him for a moment, and Roger had a chance to get a look at her face. The upper half was covered by a metal mask with a long, hooked nose. Her bottom jaw was visible, though, and she seemed to be chewing on something that dripped from one side of her mouth. He smelled her breath and identified the lumpy substance. Porridge. She sniffed hard. You, too. She pointed one long, gnarled finger at Roger and swept it slowly back to Lawrence. Disrespectful boys. Messy and slothful at home. You live in filth and grime and make others clean for you. Ignorant, 
faithless, undisciplined. She capped her tirade with a shriek that left silence in its wake. I will be seeing you later. She added ominously as she waddled slowly past. The procession of children followed her silently, like a morbid parade. Roger looked to Lawrence only to see him mouthing, What the fuck? Silently, with a shocked white expression on his face. The old woman stopped in front of Billy for a moment. Roger watched him stoop lower to address her, speaking inaudibly and looking remorseful, then smiling. After a moment, she reached up and gently stroked the end of his long, blonde beard once, then patted his belly as she resumed her waddling. The smokers parted silently for her, like the Red Sea for Moses, and the former din slowly resumed, like a volume knob was being twisted. Billy trotted back up to them as the last child passed, before the smokers could close back in around them. What the actual fuck did you say to her? Billy inquired breathlessly. What the fuck did you say to her? Lawrence demanded, deeply offended. Nothing, Billy said, putting his hands up. She started talking to me. Said I was more like men of her favorite age, whatever that means. Told me I work hard and keep a clean house? Don't know how she knew all of that, but... Hell, I'll take a compliment. His teeth gleamed in a shit-eating grin. Roger was sure he was blushing under all that man fur on his face. Roger clapped him on the shoulder, about to say something akin to good for you or you deserve it. But Lawrence cut him off with a scathing retort of, I'm sure that was awkward for you, a woman paying you a compliment. Why don't you go pick her up? Billy glared at Lawrence and held it. Roger watched as the stare seemed to grow tendrils of invisible tension reaching out to grab Lawrence eye to eye. Slowly, his brain grated into gear, and he found the words to give the axe to them. Come on, Lawrence, we know Billy's too much of a gentleman to pick up your mother. Now it was Lawrence's turn to scowl, and Billy showed his teeth. His eyes still flickered a bit, though. Let's go. Lawrence abandoned the pissing contest and strode to a metal door about ten more feet down. Before he could knock or grab the handle, though, the door banged open and a young woman backed out, arms full of garbage bags. Lawrence caught the door above her head and held it from closing. The girl kept going, mind on her mission, only realizing Lawrence was there when he tried to sneak by too soon, bumping her butt with his hip. As she turned and started prattling in German, he threw three loose bills at her, letting them flutter where they may, then disappeared inside the door. Roger followed, not about to miss his shot. He entered a small and incredibly crowded kitchen. As a nightclub, this place didn't offer much in the way of food, but that also meant they didn't appropriate much space to cook. Roger looked back for Billy and spotted him still outside the door, apologizing and stuffing the bills in the pocket of the girl's apron as she prattled on, still holding the trash. He waved a dismissal and ran to catch up with them. Billy, you truly are too good for the company you keep. Roger grinned fiercely at him. Yeah, yeah, good deed done. Let's get our party on. Boy, these Germans sure knew how to party. The whole club was a writhing mass of bodies, pumping and pulsing to the pounding of a subwoofer, fog and laser lights, cutting the darkness. Roger ascended the stairs to the balcony up to their table, as even he was out of breath trying to peek up with all the taut, twitching shapes on the floor. He was in great shape. It came with the territory of owning a sporting goods store. If you want to sell sports equipment, you got to know sports. If you want to sell high-end sports equipment, you really had to know sports. Roger loved doing his homework, and the ladies loved how it reflected in his body. Lawrence was leaning on the back of the booth seat, also sweating and panting, not used to this much physical exertion. 
Billy sat, nursing a scotch and watching the clubbers dance. Not at all used to the nightclub environment. The little bit of skin Roger could see on his face was beet red, but Roger couldn't tell if that was the scotch or the fact that the utterly voluptuous waitress in the tight sparkling dress had just leaned over and asked him if there was anything they needed, her hand gently squeezing his bare bicep before hip rolling away. Holy shit, Bill, even your beard is turning red. Roger plopped down beside him and dug his fingers into it in a noogie motion as Billy tried to fend off the unexpected attack. Maybe if I fluff it up enough, we can get her to sit on it. They both died laughing as Billy finally caught hold of Roger's wrist and forced him back. Oh, okay, let go. Dude, your hands are like vices. Roger rubbed his wrists. Sorry, man. Billy instinctively looked up at Lawrence, expecting a retort, but... Lawrence's eyes were elsewhere, down towards the floor. They followed his gaze down to the nearest cage where one of the dancers was being relieved from her shift. Both men felt the temperature drop as they realized their night was about to take a terrible turn. The club really had gone all out with the festivities. Christmas was still very much alive, even with New Year's Eve just a day away. Everything was themed right down to the dancers' costumes. They were scantily clad, of course, in glittery green corsets and tiny matching skirts with polished brown leather straps. But that's when it got weird. Their boots and gloves were hooves, with fur to the knees and elbows, and each one had fuzzy antlers and red clown noses. Roger was sure Rudolph was currently digging a hole to stick his head in somewhere, but it appeared Lawrence was having different thoughts as they made a little show of swapping out the dancer on duty with her relief. The bouncer led the new dancer down to the cage with a bit and bridle, took the contraption off her, unlocked the cage, and let the new dancer in. He then put the bit and bridle on the dancer coming out and walked her away. Billy tensed and Roger's heart jumped in his throat as the pair mounted the stairs towards the VIP section. The dancer was going to have to pass right by their table to get to the employee lounge. Lawrence was already digging for his wad. Both men started up from their seats. Billy was trying to distract Lawrence before Roger could even think of something to say. Hey Law, you, you see where the pisser is in this place? Roger could hear him shouting over the music. Why don't you piss up a rope? Lawrence abandoned all finesse, not taking his eyes off his prize. Roger looked back for the dancer. She and her gigantic bouncer escort were just reaching the top of the stairs. Roger spun back to his friends to find Lawrence already past Billy and shoving past him. Wait, Lor, wait your turn, Lawrence shoved him. As he neared the dancer, raising his cash, however, the bouncer reached out with one hand and shoved him flailing backward into Roger, sending both of them to the ground by the table. He spread his gigantic hand towards the table and rumbled, You take him out or my team will. I smell him from here. They couldn't go back out the way they had come in, that was for sure. But the front entrance was all the way across the floor. There were several bars, even more cages, and seething masses of bodies thralling like puppets on the strings of the DJ's dancing fingers. While all those served as troubling distractions, Roger's true fear was running afoul of the bouncers, sprinkled about the whole trek, towering hulks of men in all black. Roger hoped to sneak through without any of them realizing none of them had hand stamps. The shove Lawrence had received from the tree of a man upstairs had apparently forced Lawrence's alcohol consumption to catch up with him. Fortunately, the music made his rambling mostly unintelligible, as he and Billy shoulder walked him out like a wounded soldier. The clubbers reacted to the trio in all different ways. There were those who overreacted, spreading their arms and moving the crowd to give them a wide berth. Others made faces of disapproval as they were forced to pause their parting for a few seconds. 
A few of the dancers jeered and laughed at them from their cages. One girl grabbed a hold of Roger's dick through his pants, making him almost drop Lawrence in alarm. As he turned to her though, she kicked him in the ass with her studded platform boot, immediately making that cheek fall asleep and causing an uproar of laughter from the witnesses. They hit the doors marked for exit, finding them to be on the opposite end of the front of the club. To their left, they could see the line they might have still been in, if not for Lawrence's shortcut. The night air bit into Roger's sweaty skin, as sure as fangs. Shit, he interjected as they immediately changed direction to lean Lawrence against the wall. As soon as he was leaned up, Billy started rolling down the sleeves of his western-style button-up shirt. How he was dealing with the cold was beyond Roger, who at least had a suit coat on, like Lawrence. Lawrence wasn't cold at all. He was just drunk. He pushed Billy away from him as he realized he could stand against the wall without help. Then he produced a silver cigarette case from his coat pocket and pulled out a joint. Dude, do you have to light that right here? Roger was done with Lawrence's shit. He threw one arm out in a come at me bro stance, while the other tried to massage his ash cheek back awake. Fuck you. It's holiday mistletoe. He put it to his lips and began searching pockets for a lighter. Roger turned away, digging for his phone. When he finally got it out, the camera was on. He only got a second before it vibrated once and then died in his hands. Fuck. Billy, did you get Gustav's number? He shook his head. Lawrence, give me your phone. Lawrence sighed and rolled his eyes dramatically. Roger, not giving an inch, walked over and extended his hand. Lawrence tugged the phone clear of fabric and tossed it right at him, still groping for a lighter. Landing on its corner, the phone rolled end over end into the street, nearly being run over. Gah! Roger's ass cheek decided to remind him of the kick he received as he made to go after it. He stopped short right on the edge of the curb, narrowly avoiding getting hit himself. I got it. Billy was quick to realize he was the best choice to play human frogger out of the three of them. Roger watched as he got to the curb and looked down the street, timing the traffic. He waited for the next car, then darted out, snatched the phone, and scrambled back onto the curb with admirable speed for a guy who never works out. He brought it up to Roger with a wide grin that immediately melted into horror at the sight of something over Roger's shoulder. Before he could turn... He heard Lawrence's voice. Hey, sexy lady. Shit, shit, shit. This guy just couldn't give Roger a break tonight. He spun to catch sight of him, managing to spot him disappearing around the corner of the building, staggering into the alley opposite the one they'd snuck in from. With a quick glance at each other, Billy and Roger hustled to catch up with Lawrence yet again. Rounding the corner, they both froze in place so hard they nearly fell over at the unexpected sight in front of them. The alley was barely lit. Just a few small lights directly over the main doors scattered down the way. There were no crowds of smokers on this side of the building. Just one woman. One woman who looked woefully out of place in a downtown back alley. She sat in a large upholstered chair someone must have discarded. On the ground beside the chair was a large bowl embossed with the nightclub's logo with a spoon and remnants of Porridge? What was up with the porridge around here? The chair was set back just far enough into the alley where the shadow of the building completely obscured her from view until you stared directly at her. And Roger did stare. And he stared. 
something about her just didn't make sense. Her eyes flickered an icy blue in the flame of the match she produced as Lawrence approached her, joint in hand, some slurred collection of syllables dribbling from his mouth, sure as the saliva. Her eyes captured Roger in that moment and held him tight. He barely had time to register her skin color being almost porcelain white, and her hairline whiter than platinum blonde, right down to the roots. She tilted her head and lit a long, hafted pipe, holding the bowl delicately between long, elegant fingers with long, pointed nails, and blew the match out just as Lawrence looked about to bend over and light his joint. The afterimage left over from the flame made it hard to see correctly, but as her lips popped open and she inhaled through her teeth, Roger could swear they looked too long and thin, and there were too many of them visible between her pouty red lips. The puff of smoke that had emanated from them sat in a head-sized cloud that seemed to drift of its own accord directly into Lawrence's face. Lawrence backed up a step or so, hacking and waving the cloud away as a heavy smell of clove assaulted all of their noses. What? Her voice boomed suddenly, making them all jump and reverberated throughout the alley. Are you slashing about, fat man? Her voice was loud, but not strained at all, as if this was her natural volume. It was deep, but feminine, powerful. As she leaned forward, inclined her head, and slowly blew smoke out, again directly into Lawrence's face, Roger realized what was wrong with her. Her head was almost level with Lawrence's shoulder. While seated, she was a gargantuan woman, something straight out of the Guinness Book. The outline of her thigh, which Roger had thought to be both her legs crossed, was nearly as thick as Lawrence's torso. His fat torso, as she'd called him. Lawrence stood struck in disbelief at her words, probably not even registering the peculiarities of her body yet. He looked to Roger and Billy, who both stood as awestruck as he, though for different reasons. There is no way he thought she was talking to them. Neither of them had been speaking, for one, and Roger was fit and muscular while Billy was unmistakably lean. Lawrence was the only one with a bit of chub, he just wasn't used to being talked to like this. By anyone. Hey, hey, then. Th that's not nice. Lawrence began to stammer out. Oh. Her voice seemed to silence the whole world. Should I be nice? Would that be pleasing to you? She leaned back and all the features of her face Roger had managed to capture melted back into the shadow, save her eyes that still seemed to glow that cold blue. A scrape announced one of her boots sliding on the cobblestones as she brought her other foot up to cross her legs. Her boot broke the edge of the shadow, revealing a large hoof like the hooved boots on the dancers inside. But hers were white and huge, matching the rest of her body. The fur up to her knees matched her hair perfectly. Perhaps she was a headliner. You know, that's not very nice. Lawrence was sputtering gibberish and drunken indignation. Roger's brain spun a mile a minute, trying to think of what to say next to talk their way out of this new situation. 
But Billy was stunned, slack-jawed. He was reaching for Roger as if in the dark, unable to take his eyes off of her. R Rod, I, I think something's... We should go. Billy could hardly get the words out. I know, I'm trying to think, Roger answered. I'm just going to grab him. We got to just grab him and do the distance, man. We got to... Billy, I know. What's the matter? Don't you remember what Goose said? Billy was looking at Roger now, and Roger could see him fighting panic. Goose. Roger felt the blood recede from his face as the old man's ramblings flooded back into his head, making connections with all the weird parts of this evening. The old lady, the creepy kids, this great and tall woman. Things were clicking into place all too neatly, and none of it boded well for them, especially Lawrence, who was currently flying past them both, landing with a sickening thud onto the pavement. His face contorted into a scream, but only emitted a weak, high-pitched wheeze. A loud clop made Roger and Billy jump and spin around yet again. Those icy blue eyes were glowing, glowing and rising, up and up till she stood her full height, towering over the trio. Billy had started to scramble towards Lawrence before her kick had sent him flying. Roger could see him now, standing before her towering figure. Her icy eyes glowered nearly two feet above his head. Her boots clapped as she stepped from the shadows. Her porcelain skin shone in the street lamps as she approached. Her coat, or cloak rather, looked to be made of wolf pelts, many of them stitched together, grays and whites and blacks. It had no zipper or buttons and hung open from her shoulders. Underneath was a brown leather corset and a skirt made of straps that hung almost to her knees. The fur that had started just under her knees seemed to have no seam, no stocking, no nothing. It seemed as if it grew naturally from her skin. Her face set in a cold, proud expression. Sharp features cut hard curves into her porcelain skin, lips perched prominent on her mouth, red on the white like blood in the snow. A small fur cap with what looked like a brim made of holly perched atop her head. She threw off the cloak revealing the body of an Olympic athlete, not like a runner's body or a swimmer's body, like Roger would expect from someone so tall. Her body was more like a wrestler's. All her muscle groups were thick and well-defined. This was not a statuesque model or even a dancer standing before them. This was a warrior. What Roger had mistaken for a corset and skirt was a leather armor. But Roger's awe and adoration of such a strong, elegant structure seemed to boil and evaporate into utter dread as she pulled the fur cap from her head. Instead of being a brim, the holly turned out to be a wreath. And just inside that wreath were two off-white, four-inch horns. The tips so fine, they turned translucent for the last half-inch. And there was no doubt, they were growing directly from her skull. I will not suffer asperities from swine. Again, her words ceased all other senses from the moment they left her lips. Roger froze. He cowered. Her voice squeezed him almost physically into the smallest he could make his body without falling to the ground. 
He tried to quiet his own wheezing breath in hopes she'd overlook him. Her hooves struck the ground in slow, measured steps. Her hooves seemed to have the same effect as her voice. Every clop of her hooves against the sidewalk was like another squeeze from a giant, electrified hand, crushing them in place. You. She leaned down to look Billy, eye to eye, having crossed the distance between them while they had cowered. She set the point of one nail on his forehead. Are of very little interest to me. She pushed him smartly back two steps and straightened up to her full height, posturing suddenly like an elementary school teacher, she said. You are a decent man. Even when you sin, it is boring. Punishing you would not satisfy me. These words hurt less, maybe because they were directed away from Roger and Lawrence, who still wallowed on the sidewalk. Or maybe it's because she wasn't angry with Billy? However, you didn't leave porridge out for me, and I smell it on your breath. The word breath boomed as her voice had before, and the electric hand squeezed again. Through one squinted eye, Roger saw as a thin metal chain, tipped with a large hook, seemed to appear out of nowhere and whipped from her left hand to Billy's ankles. She yanked his feet out from under him and stomped his chest in, pinning him to the pavement until the dust settled. Blood flew from his mouth. The Frau stepped back and brought a switch the size of a tree limb down on Billy's whole body with her other hand. Once, twice, each blow shook the ground. Billy was cut to ribbons, hopefully only superficially. That's enough. Now just give it back. She leaned over him and stamped his stomach in so hard it emptied all over him. The frau stood above the mess and smiled, her fangs gleaming brightly. She loomed over Billy, swiped her hand across Billy's bloodied belly and flicked his blood onto her face. Then she turned her smile on to Roger. One clawed hand took hold of what was left of Billy's shirt and pulled him up to a seated position against the streetlight. She straightened back up and turned towards Roger. The clops of her hooves squeezed his body like before, worse with each step drawing her nearer. Roger tried to move away now, willing his legs to run like a madman away anywhere from here. He managed to turn but found his feet unwilling to move and he toppled over. His arms refused to respond as the ground rushed up to meet him. The air whooshed from his lungs as his chest hit the sidewalk and a new galaxy of stars exploded through his vision as his face smacked the concrete. Leaving so soon? And after you traveled all this way? The frau mocked him. So close now. She turned him over on his back with one hoof. Then she planted it on his chest and leaned onto it as she towered over him. Her hoof sunk into his chest in slow motion, pain like nothing Roger had ever felt before, till the ribs it was resting on gave way with a sickening crunch that expelled every last bit of air from his lungs in a pathetic wheeze. She stepped back off of him as he writhed, 
clinging to consciousness. Back in the school teacher's stance, eight feet above Roger, the Frau crossed her arms and smiled a closed lip smile, musing internally. She tapped her lip with one nail, idly. Let us see, she began, the notes of her voice seeming to even dim the streetlight hovering over her left shoulder in his vision. You do work hard, but you cut corners, leaving others to pick up your slack. The words were softer this time, like when she'd spoken to Billy about his menial crimes. But you are appropriately festive and reasonably polite. Perhaps you can learn as well. I shall hope you survive to do so. But, her voice boomed again, you will need chastising, and I will have my porridge. It is only right. The hoof came down on Roger's belly and forced everything up. Liquor, dinner, and finally porridge spewing out all over his face, covering his eyes as she ground his stomach flat like a cigarette butt. She ground with such force, Roger felt the back of his head lift off the ground. His hands grasped at her hoof, trying desperately to move it off him, but he lost it as it was pulled from his hands only to connect with his face, almost too fast to register. His left cheek, eye socket, and nose shattered. His skull cracked as the back of it hit the sidewalk, and he felt teeth hit his tongue. Retching uncontrollably, he instinctively rolled his head away from her and spit them out as best he could. How considerate, she cooed. Her hand wiped the blood and stomach chunks and acids from his face so he could see again. Perhaps you are learning already, she smiled. I have decided to lighten your punishment even further. With a wicked grin, she wound back with the tree size switch, suddenly back in her hand. Four times the branches slammed down on his whole body. More bones broke. Roger couldn't even discern where. Cuts opened everywhere. Bright red blood ran off his body in rivers, pooling around him on the sidewalk. Roger looked up at her through his one undamaged eye, squinting through the blood threatening to blind him once more. She swiped blood off his torso as well and flicked it onto her face with Billy's. Her lips parted slightly and her eyes closed, relishing. She seemed so very pleased. Blood popped from his lips as he broke the seal to say something, anything that might end or even delay whatever other plans she might have. But all he could emit was a horrible gurgle. Shh. That is enough now. Her blue eyes were almost soothing. Her hoof scooped under his calves and raised his feet, and he felt her chain whip around them, the hook embedding in one of his calves. His mouth opened in a silent scream, but he had no energy to voice it. He saw her tug something down, and the chain pulled him off the ground, banging hard against the streetlight. He watched upside down as a great sack appeared in her hand, and she grabbed Billy's unconscious form and threw him in. Then she lifted it over and around Roger, tying it to the chain above his feet. I have left both of you in the same sack so that you don't freeze to death. Your pig-like friend won't have that worry. 
He will be warm for the rest of his life in the pot in my head. Her laugh boomed and the bag spun. The last thing Roger remembered was his head banging off the streetlight and plunging into a blessed, dark numbness. It's been years since the incident outside the German nightclub. The German police chalked it up to organized crime. Roger thought about trying to correct the story, but there were a hundred witnesses right down the street that had seen the attack right under the streetlight. If that was the story to them, Roger figured it wasn't even worth it. Incident was his therapist's word for it. He never judges his story, only asks questions. How did that make you feel, or... What do you think that represents, and such? He cares, he just won't believe. Roger kept in contact with Billy this time. They both called and answered each other's calls, but the conversations never went far. Day-to-day stuff always melted into long, dreadful silences. Roger didn't know what Billy told people. A mountain climbing accident that left one friend dead and he and another hospitalized for months seemed enough to dissuade conversation well enough. Roger didn't want to talk about it. Never wanted to. It played in his head often enough. Every time he saw a mess he made, anything out of place, a spill, a pile that could have been a neat sack, anything, And he never ate anything that resembled porridge again. No oatmeal, shredded wheat, nothing even close. Still, once a year, for 12 days in a row, he found himself making old-fashioned porridge from scratch and leaving it in his comfiest recliner before cleaning his entire house to perfection and hiding behind the locked door of his bedroom. He'd connect his TV to his headphones and play Christmas specials at full volume every night until exhaustion finally took him. The bowl was always empty in the morning. (laughs) 